How many of you guys were here last year? So some of you guys saw my keynote last year, right? Okay, some of the stuff you'll see is the same, and there's a real good reason for that. It's because a lot of things just have not changed in the last year, and a lot of it is a little different. So I wrote a book called Return on Relationship, which a lot of that thinking started um, when I started working for a guy named Seth Godin, who many of you may have heard of, in 1997 at his startup called Yo-Yo Dine. Um, Seth started the first online direct marketing company, but while he was there, he coined a term that all of you guys have become very familiar with, permission marketing. He wrote an article for Fast Company. It became a bestseller book after the article. Um, and it's really where I started spending a lot of time with Seth and talking about customer experience and what's important, how do you connect with people. And permission marketing is really about relationships. It's about not connecting with people unless they really want to be connected with. So my follow-up book, which was part of the original book, and it's extended in the second book, is called How to Look People in the Eye Digitally. And it's a little bit more of what do we really need to do, what's the problems out there, and how do we change them. So first of all, a little bit about me. Um, I joined Seth in 1997 at Yo-Yo9. Um, digital marketing company. I got involved in this space very, very early when e-commerce was simply catalogs online. Um, and people really didn't understand where we, were going with, where we were going with this. So I just want to make something clear. I move around a lot. I also got my audience kind of spread out here, so I'm going to try to you know, talk to each of you a little bit as I move around. Um, my head is like a Twitter feed. So things pop in and out of it. Um, my slides are really very basic. I go off on tangents. I might look at somebody and think of something. So you guys got two choices. You can let me finish what I'm saying, and when I'm done, you can either let me keep going or you can say, hey, you never finished what you were talking about before. So <laughs> that a deal? Deal. Yep. OK. So we are marketing in an age of digital disruption. There was a, the keynote this morning was about disruption and what is happening. And the point I loved best about that is really where I see disruption going, and I think that's what we were hearing this morning, is it's about customer experience. I mean, if you make an experience better, why is Uber so incredibly successful? Why is Airbnb so successful, even with all the regulations that states and cities are trying to do against it? Because it makes our experience much more seamless. It makes it easier. It's really the start of what I believe is peer-to-peer -peer commerce, which we're not at yet. Peer-to-peer -peer commerce is actually when I am buying directly from you without an intermediary. Right now, we're not there, but we're getting close. It's probably the closest thing to social commerce that we've ever actually experienced. And disruption's everywhere. And what does it do? It's made marketing hard. But the tools make it look easy. And the problem is, and by the way, you know, I love what SDL does. I love what all the companies do that are getting you guys more data, more information, easier ways to dig down to it. But the problem is, too many people focus only on the data. They don't focus on the judgment and instinct, which to me still rule. And judgment and instinct to me say that relationships rule. And that's what you need to be building and how you have to be dealing with people. So the tools are making it look easy. You click a button here, you schedule a few tweets, you put out some stuff on Buffer, you follow some people back. Hey, I did social. This is great. I built relationships. But you haven't. You haven't done anything. Somebody might have stuck their hand out to you, but Lance and I shaking hands does not make us friends. That's an open door to starting a friendship. So I want to play this video for you. I don't usually play videos when I speak, but to me, first of all, some of you guys will remember this clip because it's awesome. But second of all, it's really to the point of what's the problem. It's really too bad because this is an awesome clip. So we're gonna, we're, I'm going to make believe that I'm Brad Pitt. OK? Guys, you, that's believable, right? OK? And have you, any of you guys seen Moneyball? OK? Have any of you guys seen this scene? What this scene is all about is a standard CM, a room of, of all marketers sitting in a room with CMO and a CEO and a CFO. And they're all, they're all looking at him saying, guys, why aren't we doing better? And there's a guy behind the table trying to explain that things are changing. And he's saying to them, what is it? What's the problem? And the guys go, the problem in this scene, the guys are saying, the problem is we lost Giambi. We have to replace him. He goes, no. Right? He comes back and says, what's the problem? He says, we lost 37 home runs. We need to replace him. No, that's not the problem. This is what we're hearing in boardrooms everywhere. The guys are saying, we just don't have enough ads out there. Our competition is advertising more than we are. They're getting more people to listen to them. They're selling more goods. That's not the problem. Now, you guys are missing. This is awesome, because during this, there's a bunch of old guys at the end of the table, and they're all kind of scratching their heads. And at some point, somebody says something about Fabio. And one of the guys says, who's Fabio? And another guy says, oh, he's a shortstop for Houston. You guys all know who Fabio is, right? Okay? So we're going to move on past this since it's not working. And we're going to define the problem that the video's not working. Okay. 
So the problem is, this is me on stage last year talking at this event, telling people you know what doesn't work for a social media strategy. Not being social. I'm gonna say it again. You know what doesn't work for a social media strategy? Not being social. And what I've been seeing, I've been watching, is it's not changing. People are just pushing out more content. You hear content is king. Content, content, content. Sure, content's great, but it's engagement that you guys are looking for. That's what builds the relationship. You can't be social by buying ads on Facebook or Twitter or Snapchat or whatever else you're looking at. Those are ads. You guys are just buying advertisements. And marketing and advertising are going like this. Now please, understand something. I'm not saying advertising doesn't work. It does. Advertising can be great as long as it, it's an awareness builder. It gets you in people's minds. But the next step is marketing, which is convincing people to shop with you, to buy from you, to work with you, to take your service rather than somebody else's. We need to do what I call starting to look people in the eye digitally. What does that mean? when you guys first got your lessons from your family, whether it was for a first date, whether it was meeting a teacher, going on an interview, or like my dad, when he taught me about going on my first business meeting, he told me get there early, look around the building, find out something about the neighborhood, see if you can get the secretary to put you in the guy's office before he gets there so you can see what's on the walls. What pictures does he have? Does he have kids? Is he a grandparent? Does he like to play golf? Does he, does he ski? Is he a fisherman? Why? To get points of connectivity. I like to say that I think the best marketers out there are former great salespeople. If you guys have great salespeople in your company and they're tired of selling, or you want to move another area, have them help you market. Because these guys, the best ones, know how to do what? They know how to listen. But more importantly, they know how to hear. They know how to react to what they're hearing. A lousy salesman gets on the phone, spends half an hour pitching his product. Not one word comes from the guy on the other end of the phone. When he's done, then he tries to close him because he's taught. You got to close him. You know, it takes till five to seven times to close a guy. So if you quit it for close number four, you lose. But what he's not doing is finding out what the pain points are. He's not conversing. He's not chatting. He's not getting to know this person. He's not connecting with him. Truth be told, the majority of business done is done via relationships. Whether that relationship is just that I like Amazon, I think they like me, they're good to me, they treat me well, they give me a seamless experience. Every once in a while I go to return something and they say just keep it. You guys ever have that happen to you? You know why that happens, really? Because it's less expensive for you to keep it. Now you know what that thing really costs to build. But also, it's because they want to show you that they care about you. When I was at Elf Cosmetics back in 2000 and 2008 and 2009, we had a lot of products that broke because we were selling Dollar Cosmetics. Anybody here, ladies, you're familiar with Elf Cosmetics? It was Dollar Cosmetics. We were meeting with the prestige brands. The company was selling about 8 to $10 million in sales. And mostly it was based on price points. And they hit a wall. And I was fortunate enough that somebody found me, asked me to come in there and said, we need somebody that can think outside the box and figure out how do we go to the next level because we have no marketing budget, zero. I became the CMO of a company with zero marketing budget. Okay? Now you might say, why the hell would you do that? Well, truth be told, because it's fun. Because now you have to really learn how to be a marketer. Rather than spending a hundred, anybody can take a hundred million dollars, buy media, sell shit. Right? But what you got to learn about, and there's a reason I wear this shirt, you got to learn about being good to people, whether it's your employees, whether it's other vendors, it's creating value for other people by getting to know who they are, what their pain points are, what's important to them. So at ELF, I recognize there were a lot of brands out there that wanted to speak to women when they were in an aspirational frame of mind. Well, there's no more aspirational frame of mind than when a woman's playing with cosmetics. Okay? I'll tell you that right now. I would send out boxes of cosmetics, dollar cosmetics, to people. I was not a cosmetics marketer. I was just a marketer. I was a sales guy. And invariably, the email I got back the next morning after they received it was, and by the way, this is 17 to 70, mostly high-level people, VPs, people that are in my area, people that I know. Invariably, like, the email I got back was, oh my God, I was up all night playing with my new stuff. 
Beth Comstock told me that she loved our product and wrote to me and told me how much fun it was. You guys know who she, Beth Comstock is? She's the CMO of GE. Okay? So we're talking about high-level people. So what I recognized was people want to feel good. They want to know you care about them. They want to hear. They want to hear from you. One of the ways we sold our product inexpensively was that we had very cheap packaging. Because if you don't know this, three quarters of the price of cosmetics is in the packaging. Only a quarter is in the product. Point of purchase, how it looks, what makes people buy. So we went in the opposite direction. We gave something that was inexpensive, and we took that out. So what happened? A lot of products got damaged when they got delivered. When people would call up and want to send it back, we would tell them to keep it because it costs more to take it back. And we'd send them an entire new order. We wouldn't even ask which piece was broken. And I started pushing that out on social media. And the owners went crazy. Oh my God, everyone's going to call up and just say one piece was broken and get a new order. But people don't do that. People don't cheat in general. From a very, I mean, I'm talking high percentages. Our numbers of people that were asking for, for product went up by a fraction but our sales went up dramatically because people shared it and told people how we cared about them. We are super connected, yet most of you guys are disconnected. When was the last time one of you guys picked up the phone and actually spoke to somebody? I think I saw one hand go up in the room, okay? In general, people don't do that. How many of you guys have been on email strings where one phone call could have ended 30 emails, right? I mean, it happens all the time. I'm like, just pick up the phone, call the person, say, do it this way, done. End of discussion, end of clarifications, done. But people aren't doing it because we've become disconnected. When people aren't in present in a conversation, there's no true connection. So what you guys got to do in your companies, in your personal brands, is you got to do what I call start looking people on the eye digitally. Best social media book ever written was written in 1936. Guys got a clue what that is? It's called How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Every one of you guys should own it. Every one of your employees should own it. And every one of them should be required to dig into it every single week. I keep a copy everywhere. I have a copy on my iPhone, on my iPad. I keep one on my dresser. Because Dale Carnegie talks about personal connection. Why is it more relevant now than then? Because then maybe you met, in 1936, maybe you met 100 people in your career or in your community. Now you're meeting tens of thousands every day digitally. Online relationships require the same attention as personal relationships, but here's the beauty of them, and this is how you scale it. You don't really have to connect with every person, because in the old world, if I met Lance and I was just speaking to him, nobody else really knew about it unless it was at an event or in a party. If maybe it was in a store and there was one other person listening. Now everybody is watching your conversations especially as a brand, if you're smart enough to have them publicly and not try to draw them into the private space. People participate vicariously. I hear this all the time from brands. How can we possibly answer people? We have 10,000, a million, 100,000 people that are fans on our Facebook page. Well, guess what? The vast majority of them have no interest at all in speaking to you. But what they do is they watch the conversations you have with others and they participate vicariously. They think they're a part of that. They also say, that could be me. So if I reach out to a brand and ask a question and they answer me, everybody else watching. And by the way, a lot of that stuff is not even showing up in your data. Okay? I hear from people, I hear from people all the time will tell me, you know, your Facebook page is not, not that engagement. So, only so many people liked it. Because the vast majority are never liking it. They're never clicking on it. They're never commenting, but they're coming there if you're putting out valuable information all the time. You guys have heard that Facebook algorithms are killing you, right? From an organic reach. Well, guess what? Organic reach is not dead. You just got to do the work. Okay? What Facebook is doing is making the experience, yes, number one, they do want to make money and they want to charge you, but they also are making the experience better for the consumer. Because if the consumer's not there, you guys don't know where to advertise. But if you put up valuable information, if you put up valuable content, if you interact and engage with people, if you visit their pages, they will come to yours. Here's a great stat for you. 100% of the people that come to your Facebook page actually see your Facebook page. 100%. So if people wake up in the morning and say, I want to go to this Facebook page because I want to see the funny story, I don't care if it's a goddamn silly cat that they're coming for, if it works for you, if it works for them, if the conversions happen, if they want to see what I'm doing with my daughters, I'm a divorced dad, 
I got CEOs and CMOs all over the country that come to me and comment about things I do with my daughters, about things I do on the weekends. They talk more about my socks, which I've become known for, and I know I'm doing a good job because everybody I bumped into here that knew me from last year, the first thing they wanted to know was what socks I was wearing. But what does that do? That makes it easy for them to come up and converse with me. It gives them a point of emotional connection to start a conversation because every one of those people, that conversation went beyond just what socks are you wearing. CEOs stop me in lobbies of buildings and want to take a photo with me with my socks and then have a conversation. They talk about my daughters and I write a lot of marketing material and I know they're reading it because they quote me on that stuff too. But I got to tell you, the vast majority of these people, I never see them unless I see them. They don't, market, they don't make a mark. I never even knew they were there. But they're sharing my content, they're talking about it, they're coming back every day, and that's what you guys can do by connecting in that way. Oh. Customers don't trust brands and they don't want more products. They want their life to be easier. Uber's great because I don't have to have a different taxi company in every city and different people I have to call. When I call up my regular guy who's supposed to take me to the airport, and he tells me he's booked. It's easy. Customers do trust people. Start letting your employees speak to customers. Now, there was an article today that I read this morning, and it was talking about the 15 blunders in social media over the last year. Stop reading those posts, people. Okay? Because nobody cares. They really don't. And everyone he mentions goes, you remember that big gaffe that US Air did? I don't. Do you? Okay, I didn't remember one of the things they mentioned until I dug into the post, because people have a very short attention span. This social stuff comes and goes. Yes, they can search it and find it, and when someone wants to have a problem with you, it's there. But people don't care about that. Let your employees start speaking for you. When they make mistakes, no problem. Say, I made a mistake. And don't apologize if you're not wrong, and don't apologize if you don't mean it. JetBlue has a policy. They respond to everybody, but they will not be bullied. You threaten them, by sharing a bad experience, or you better upgrade me or I'm going to do this. That's the fastest way to get disconnected from JetBlue. The fastest way for them to say no. It's no different than dealing with our kids. It's about training people about how you care about them, what works, and customers do seek new experiences. And by the way, that new experience can be as simple as interacting and engaging with them. How many of you guys know brands that respond to people on every channel publicly? I don't know one. Has anybody seen anybody respond to people on Facebook? For some reason, companies have decided that Twitter is the communication platform. So that's where they do the customer service. And then I go to places, you've heard of Harry's? You know, they do, the, they, they, they do the glasses and they're supposed to be the best social company out there. Try to get them to answer even a question like, I, not, no, I'm sorry, Harry's is the Warby Park. Warby Park, but I'm talking about Harry's, the, the, the shaving company. So I bought Dollar Shave Club, I hated it. I said, there's no way I'm going to buy this again. I went back to Gillette, but I also hate that my stuff doesn't get delivered because I hate paying how much they cost. But when it gets delivered and automatically hits your credit card, you kind of forget about it, right? So I reached out to Harry's to see if there's that. I said, right out, I'd love to buy your product. Tell me, is it any better than, a, than Dollar Shave Club? I've said it 15 times. They've never once responded. If they would respond once and say, I'm really not sure, why don't you try it, we'll see. I probably would try it. But I really won't try it now that they won't respond to me. All they have to do, it's so simple, people, have people on your team like posts. Have them go and engage with people. Have them actually go to the pages of the people that follow you. How many here, any, anybody here work for consumer packaged goods companies? Nope. Okay. Anybody here work for B2B companies? Any of you guys have Facebook pages? LinkedIn? People put comments there? Does anybody respond to them? Answer them? Say you just like the post, you can have a damn intern. Just click like on a post. It really doesn't take a lot to go like that. I've trained so many people to do this. It's remarkable. You can train your employees to do simple responses. How can I help you? That's another one that's really hard to teach. And you really have to get training and you have to certify people in your company to be able to do it. Let them go on to social, represent your company, and say, how can I help you? Old marketing was dictation. New marketing is communication. We need to change from convince and convert to converse and convert. I like to say that conversation is the best content. 
So speaking about conversation, I'm going to take a quick little side thing here because I keep looking at Molly and she's kind of staring at me because I forgot to mention my... My CX. So there's a contest going on here, guys, to write about your favorite CX experiences. So please participate. Hashtag it, my CX. It's really cool. They're just trying to engage and get some people involved. Get the conversation going. So I wear these shirts because I have a hashtag, just be nice. And I, and I don't want to make a t-shirt out of it. I don't want to make it part of my brand. But I discovered this woman who discovered me when I started writing all the tweets about how companies just have to be nice to people. It's as simple as smiling. What does Nordstrom do so well that Saks Fifth Avenue, Neiman Marcus, and, Blue, and, Blue, and Bloomingdale's doesn't do? They talk to you. They come out from behind the counter. They must come out from behind the counter and make that personal connection. I like business cards. I tell people all the time, I wrote a blog post, don't tell me you don't have a business card. Don't tell me, just connect with me on LinkedIn. First of all, how am I going to connect with all of you guys? How am I going to remember your names? How to spell them? But besides that, when you give me your business card, you watch me. Every time, I will take it, I will look at it, I will look at your name, I will see if there's anything individual on there. It might be something as simple as where you're from. Sometimes if there's, we don't put cities on our things anymore, so I look at the area code or something because it gives me a point of contact. It shows you that I'm interested in you. Start showing people that you're interested. It's really not that hard. A brand is what a business does. A reputation is what people remember. There was another article I saw this morning, and I was just looking at these things because I thought they were very relevant to this conference because they were about customer experience. And it was talking about the most of the money spent on branding is a waste. Because people are saying, this is who we are, yay. Be like me, love my product. But what their, their brand is actually built on experiences, on how people interact and engage. This stuff is so simple, people. It really is. You just need to start empowering your employees. You have to start making it part of your culture that you answer questions, that you reach out to people, that you actually listen to them. All the listening software in the world means nothing if you don't act upon the intelligence you're getting and use your heads to think what's best and to actually think. You know, what I love about social is face to face. I've got to answer you immediately. If I'm behind the counter at a store and you say to me, so what are you going to do about this? I just stand there and go, hmm. hmm, I don't know. That person is going to get out of their mind. But when you're digital, you have that moment. There are expectations of quick answers, but nobody's expecting you to answer in three seconds. They're expecting you to come back with a reply that makes sense. And by the way, that reply can be as simple as, let me see what I can do. There are simple phrases that you can teach your staff that make you into a responsive company, that make you into a responsive person. If you're only focused on the money, you completely risk overlooking the people. It's that simple. Just be nice. Anybody here ever see the movie Roadhouse with Patrick Swayze? He's, tra he's training bouncers. Right? And he's trying to clean up a place, and he says to them, and the place is all fights every day, and he says, just be nice. And I won't mention kind of the, the comments, the, but what if they do this? What if he says that? It doesn't matter. Just be nice. Until it's time to not be nice. And then there's, just, there's only one person that holds the rein on that when is it time not to be nice. Start getting to know your customers and prospects. You're not doing it. You're looking at software. You're reading data. You're reading key points. We have X amount of women between 25 and 35. A certain percentage of them live in certain states. That's not getting to know people. The intelligence is all out there for you. Start going to pages and seeing what people are saying. Forget about how many people are coming to your Facebook page. How many Facebook pages can you go to in a day? If you don't know who your people are, you might as well throw your marketing and sales dollars out the window. And most of you are. You're throwing it away. You're looking at trends. You're not seeing all this valuable information that's out there every day. You guys know what that is? It's a proverbial fly on the wall. Right? You guys all know that expression? I wish I was a fly on the wall in that meeting. Well, guess what? Most consumers and your competitors and your vendors are inviting you into their living room and you're not going. You're not going to see what they're talking about. You're not going to your competitors and even seeing what are they writing about. How much engagement are they getting? 
If I'm in B2B, the first thing I'm going to do is see what kind of comments are happening on those pages. Who's complaining? What are they saying? And I don't want to see it in a spreadsheet. I want to see it in real life. I want to get my employees engaging with these people and finding out real pain points. I want to bring them to a meeting and let some brainstorming actually happen. How many, when was the last time you guys were in a meeting where brains were actually storming? Right? You go to the same meeting, two people speak, you're either afraid of your boss or you wanna, you're either afraid that you're going to say something stupid, you're afraid in front of your co colleagues that they're going to think that you're trying to come up with something brilliant, you're afraid that somebody might look at you in the wrong way and nobody's sharing information. I haven't been in a decent brainstorming session in five years. But I have amazing ones online. Because I go and I watch conversations. And then I jump in with a comment or two. Sometimes that's not even my real opinion. I'm just doing it to spark the conversation. I'm not being disingenuous. I'm not saying I believe in. I'm just saying, what about if this happens? And then 20 people jump in with comments. This, you can find these groups on LinkedIn. You can find them on Facebook. I've got to tell you something, people. You want to really understand what social is about? How many people here use Snapchat? Do you only use it to communicate with your kids? Because <laughs> I, I have an 18 year old daughter. She's almost got to the point where she doesn't even answer my text anymore. It used to be, you know, if I tried to call her, I'd get a, a text in three seconds that said, what, with an exclamation point. <laughs> and I had to learn, I'm a divorced dad, so I'm not around, I can't say you better do this, or you're not getting whatever. And I finally learned how to communicate with her text. Now I gotta make silly faces on Snapchat to get her attention. But what I've learned by watching my daughter is a number of things. First of all, what Snapchat really is, it, what's amazing about it, is people learning to communicate without words. Making faces, making expressions, doing dances. But here's the best part about Snapchat, and I'm not telling you guys that you should use it for your business. Because that's an individual decision. I don't know what you do. I would never make a blanket statement like that. But go and see what's happening there. I say this all the time. I wrote a post, I think it was for you guys, for Inside CXM, about how CEOs have to get involved in social. They must. That doesn't mean they have to tweet all day. It means they have to start reading, paying attention to these platforms, seeing what's happening. Go to Snapchat. Snapchat is a microcosm of what all social media should be. It's all about engagement and communication. If you're on Snapchat and you're not either engaging Conversing or having fun, get off it. There are some brands having remarkable success with Snapchat, not by buying ads. And again, I'm not saying the ads are bad. They might be great ads. You measure that the same way you measure any media buy you make. But what they're doing is they're learning there about the need to engage and communicate. And what happens is on Twitter, on Facebook, on all these other platforms, we're being led to believe we don't have to do that because to you guys and to me, I mean, from where we came from, it looks like a broadcast medium. Hell, I can get a million followers on Twitter. I can shoot out content. It gets in front of a lot of people. Depending on who you're talking to, it reaches 10 to 2 million, depending on who's trying to sell you what. But the truth of the matter is, probably one tweet maybe reaches 1% of the people who actually see it. But then again, it also goes to, if you get a reputation for writing good content, more people pay attention to your content. When Facebook, when you had 100% organic reach, everybody was ignoring what was there because they knew it was ads. Now, if it comes into their feed, it's something that's either relevant or it's an ad. And it either says it's an ad or it's something that they want to see. But Snapchat is amazing because people are communicating and engaging. Watch what millennials are doing there. Watch what kids are doing there. It's kind of remarkable. And stop being so scared of millennials, for God's sake. They're just people. I go to these things. What are millennials thinking? That's like asking that. I mean, every generation. What are the kids thinking? Oh, kids today. Okay? What's different is it's, I like to liken it to the genetics versus environment question when it comes to certain things. It's not genetics, people. They are the same human beings that we are. They're going to get older. They're going to need insurance. They're going to buy a house at some point. They might not need cars. Why? That's environment. Because you don't need a car anymore. We didn't have that choice. You had to get a car if you wanted to get somewhere. Now, between Uber, cars to go, and every other service that's coming up, you don't need one. But they're no different. But what they have is they're used to different tools. They communicate differently. They expect information faster. And they get to do things on and on. I like to say, and I heard this first from David Farman, I like to give credit where credit is due, that boomers and millennials are almost the same. And if you think about boomers, not the young ones like me, but the ones that were really in the 60s, Hippies, they were the first people that really cared about the environment. They started trying to make movements that wanted to change things that governments were doing. Why did they stop? Because they didn't have the tools to do it when they started maturing. They had to earn a living. 
They have to do other things. They didn't have all these platforms that create the age of influence where they can keep doing these things. So this is changing and it's bleeding into everybody else because we're all realists and we can do it too. We can build our own personal brand. You got to start amplifying customer experience. You guys all know that. That's why you're here. So how do you do it in real simple ways? Always address people by name. Always, always, always. If you're in a digital channel and somebody responds to you, when you answer them, mention their name. This is classic Dale Carnegie, people. The, the, the word that every person likes the best, the sound of, is the sound of their own name no matter what language it's in. Follow me on Twitter. I mean, I tweet hundreds of times a day. I communicate with people on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and every time I respond to them, and sometimes I'll miss, but sometimes I'll even go back. You'll see me and go edit it because I realize I left out Janet's name. And even though I know Janet for years, when I respond to her, I put her name in the response. Do it in emails. Do it in texts. It's extra work, but it will pay off when I reply to people via email. Jeff Clark, you can answer, I was dealing with him. I will answer most of the time, until, unless you're getting into one of those quick back and forths, I will put their name in the response. I do it in text also. It takes a few extra seconds, but it makes the people and person know that you're focusing on them. It's also a great way to not make a mistake in sending an email to a wrong person. <laughs> because you got yourself focused on it. Find something in their bio and mention it. Again, follow me on Twitter. You'll see a lot of times if I see someone's from Park City, I will invariably say I love to ski in my response to them. Thanks for sharing my, you know, my tweet or thanks for doing this or here's the answer to your question. By the way, love to ski. I don't mention that they're from Park City. They know exactly what I'm doing. I'm making a comment just like I might be telling somebody at a party, I love the dress you wore. That blue dress was great. How does it, what happens with that? That woman knows I was actually paying attention to her. I didn't say just the dress. I mentioned something specific about it. Show them you're listening to what they're saying. We're all guilty of this. We don't pay attention, especially men, right? We don't care what the other guy is saying. We just want to wait till you finish so we can say what we want to say. We're even thinking about what we're going to say next while you're talking. And 90% of the time, the response has nothing to do with what you mentioned in your last response. Right, ladies? I mean, is it true? We look over your head at the instrument scores and we nod our head. If one time we'd get up and take the garbage out, we'd probably win you over for at least the next three weeks, but we're incapable of doing that. But you've got to start doing it in business because that's going to be your livelihood. I can't speak for your marriages. I'm probably no better at it than anybody else here. Well, I'm actually definitely not better at it. <laughs> Make it personal and authentic. Let people know you really care. And that means you need to follow through. So I have, all, I mean, I have 10 different Twitter handles. I've got about a million followers. And one thing that I, the thing I love the most, I don't care what list I hit, what, what's the most influence? I just hit an employee advocacy list yesterday. What makes me happy is when people say, he is who he is. He walks the walk. He is his brand. He cares about people. I tell people all the time, call me, I will call you back. My phone number is 516-270-5511. I give it out on stages to five and 10,000 people. First of all, I can do it because nobody calls. It's awesome. <laughs> okay? So everybody tweets out, oh my God, Ted Rubin gave out his phone number. And, and somebody invariably calls me while I'm on stage, and no, I do not have my phone on me, so don't try. It's in my jacket. Um, but they tell people, and he gave out his phone number, but I, I end up getting maybe two, three calls, and then the really cool thing is those people then say, oh my God, I called him, and he, and he answered, or he called me back. So my favorite was I was at an Origami Owl direct selling event. I don't know if you know who they are. They're a remarkable company that in four years blew up from a 14-year-old girl's idea to $300 million, $350 million in sales. And I had a room full of 5,000 women, and I got 300 calls. And I called everyone back. It took me about three days. And when I was on my third day, and I called one woman back, she goes, well, some return on relationship. It took you three days to call me back. <laughs> so you can't win with everybody. But she also expected that she was one of three people that called. And when I told her that she was one of 300, she started apologizing. So if, you, if you're straight with people, if you give them an opportunity and then somebody else tweeted something about it that I hadn't called them back yet, and 50 people, let your people protect you. Let your advocates stand up for you. When someone bitches and complains and says something that's just hateful, let it go. Jay Bear is saying, hug your haters. I've been saying this for years. Every brand I've ever worked at, I search for the critics online. I search for the haters that have legitimate concerns, not just the true haters because those kind of haters just hate and I ignore them. But when you wrap your arms around them, they go away. And find them on all possible channels. 
Stop trying to drag people to where you want them. I would have to wager a bet that the majority of people in this room are email marketers. You're in B2B, you love to have your email list, it's great, you can watch your open rates, you know who's communicating, you can give them direct information, you can put tons of information in there, but what you're doing is you're going to people that you're social selling on Twitter, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, and by the way, LinkedIn probably one of the most overlooked platforms, even with what they've been doing today. I don't spend enough time there. Every day I say I have to spend more time there. There's so much value going on there with publishing and conversations. But go to where they are. Don't take them on LinkedIn and send them that direct message or that vet email that goes out to everybody with their name dropped in saying join our, our email marketing list. Or do it once and then stop if they don't. And go there. It takes time. It's work. But there's no way I'm going to get my daughters to call me on the phone. I have to go to where they are. So I like to say, if you're trying to sell me something, then you've got to come to where I like. I happen to like email and text. I get way too many direct messages. People try to connect correctly there. I don't get alerts on my phone for social because I get way too many. And if you look at me and you know anything about it, when was the last time you guys had somebody connect with you on LinkedIn and you get an email about two seconds later, it says, so what do you do? Seriously? What do I do? It's all there. Right? Or they connect with you. Now, I'm really open. First of all, here's some also tips for you about looking people in the eye digitally. Never reach out to somebody on LinkedIn without a personal message. Stop clicking those buttons. I know that on the app, you can't put a personal message, so don't do it on the phone app. Take the time to get in front of your laptop. You guys are all professionals. I don't see any children in this room. Get on there and say, great meeting you at SDL Innovate, and write something personal. I first learned this from Seth Godin. Three things. Business comment, personal comment, and then a general, you know, relationships like muscle tissue. The more you engage them, the stronger, the more valuable they become. Something that's about you, your brand, what you believe in. And send it out that way. And if somebody connects with you and you want to accept their connection, never accept it without writing back a personal note. I can't tell you how much value I get out of that. And how many times, I'd say one in ten, I get notes back saying, oh my God, you're the first person that ever did that. It's really important. But how about the people, again, don't be that person because some of you guys, I know you're probably in the sales field, you got quotas, you push out this stuff, you get people that follow you to immediately send them a, by the way, my company sells ABC. Really? I just put out my hand, I just shook it, I invited you in, and you don't even buy me a cocktail and you're already trying to get me in bed. I mean, seriously? It takes a couple of notes. And there's so much information, it's all there, you can personalize it like incredible. People put everything out there. You can talk about their babies, about their families, about their kids, about their business, about their boss who they hate because they just tweeted about it. My boss sucks too. I mean, you can, that's how you can connect with these people. And send a helpful note every once in a while. Serendipitously go into your following or your company's followings and reach out to people. That news will spread. I can't do that to that many people, but people talk about it. Answer everybody that reaches out to you. Do not go home at night without responding to every email. This response can be, I don't have time for this right now. I do this all the time. I got a lot on my plate right now. Can you please ping me back in two weeks? First of all, I get rid of a lot of the nonsense because the people that don't really care, they're just blasting out emails, never ping me back. I didn't waste my time. But I, again, a reputation that I'm responsive. I get back to people. Make that about you, make that about your company. And take it offline. Go to events like this. Meet people. Do meetups. It's so easy these days. Every city I go to, something goes out and says, I'm meeting with people. When I'm here for these four days, every other hour is filled up with people. I put it out on social and I say, who wants to meet? A lot of, now, I don't have time to put a lot of these things together, but in certain cities, someone reaches out and says, hey, if I did a meetup, would you come? Absolutely. I'm going to Phoenix on Thursday. It's a big meetup, Saturday night. I got 40 people in the social media community from Phoenix coming to this meetup. And all I'm doing is showing up. But I'm putting myself out by giving my time, connecting with people, let them know that if I'm in a city, I will see you. And by the way, people, it's so great because most of the people don't really have the time. They say, hey, will you meet me for a cup of coffee? Sure. How about Tuesday at 3? Oh, I'm not available for another month. Okay, well, I offered. Find something in their bio and make mention of it. Look at this guy. Look at all the information. Look at all the valuable intel he's given you. He's the VP of design at Twitter. He's a harsh critic of coconut water, eggs, and people who put clothes on their pets. I mean, how hard is it to start a conversation with this guy? Soul in Seattle, bottle, body in San Francisco. Almost every bio out there is giving you something. Now, personally, I like to use quotes in most of the bios of my things because it gives people the ability to look into my soul a little bit. So the quote on at Ted Rubin is, life is not about waiting for the storm to pass, it's about learning to dance in the rain. 
I get so many people that come to me and make comments about that or say, oh my God, that's the way I want to live. Or what does that mean to you? Or do you really live that way? And it's just, it's a conversation opener. But try different things. There's no one set way. It's a matter of what works for you. But try to stay away from I'm a social media strategist and I help companies build their brands, blah, 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 blah. Give them something. Just like you want to find stuff when you go to somebody's page. And the other thing is, by the way, this Twitter page is a piece of real estate. I put all my other Twitter handles on it. I put other information. I give my Facebook page. I give a lot of information on how people can connect with me. The need for recognition goes well beyond just names. Engage, captivate, and make it remarkable. People, you can stand out so easily. I mean, I mean people say to me, oh, social and B2B. Social and B2B is the best place to do social. You really get to know who the people are. It's a, limited, it's a limited world. They're putting out a lot of information. And tell me the truth, but in B2B, it's the relationship that sells more than anything. I mean, you can't really say, Nordstrom's can't say, well, everyone comes in here because they love us. No, they come in very often because they need something, or the price is right, or it's in the neighborhood. But B2B is all about relationships. I get calls from CMOs all over the country, and they say to me, Ted, you know, I need someone to help me out with social listening, or I need someone to help me out with whatever. I need to hire somebody. And very often the next word is, I'll say, well, I'm not really sure. They go, it doesn't have to be the best. It doesn't have to be. I just want a company that's reliable, that delivers what they say they're going to deliver, and then either you work with or somebody you know work with and had success. That's the relationship. And that's the way most of that business is done. Awareness equals revenues. The only way you can sell something is if people know who you are. Differentiators equal margins, and the differentiator in this case can be as easy, and I'm telling you right now, if any of you guys know anybody in the consumer space or even in your space, if you become that company that answers every tweet, JetBlue built their brand, turned it around from a negative time by responding to people. They're not taking off because people are complaining. They're not finding your luggage if it's in a different city because you're angry. What they're doing is making you feel heard, and that's Connecting. Authenticity equals loyalty and advocacy. And they're all measurable and they all equal increased profits. When people ask me, what's the ROI of social? The first thing I do is ask back, what's the ROI of trust and what's the ROI of loyalty? There's something that everybody in all your C-suites understands. Lifetime value of a customer, average order value, frequency of purchase. No matter what business you're in, and those numbers can all be affected every day by looking people in the eye digitally, by getting to know who they are, by making them feel heard. And a lot of you guys are probably sitting out there going, well, you know, who is this guy? This stuff is like common sense. Sure, you know, I learned this when I was in kindergarten. Well, guess what, people? Common sense is not that common because the vast majority of you guys are not doing it. I can't tell you how many times I'm on panels and they ask us, panel of social experts, who's doing it right? And guys sitting there like, um, I wish you'd asked me this before I came here so I could have researched it because I don't know. Because it's hard to name a company. Start empowering your employees and they will power your brand. You guys are overlooking all these people. You're, you're pushing them into their little shells. Start helping them build their influence. Especially in B2B. Oh my God. Make them into experts. There's a company in New York now called Brightmore. One of their jobs is surfacing experts in companies, people that are likely to be able to build the content to make them an industry expert. Have those people in your company. Teach them how to use these platforms. Bring in people to speak to inspire them, to build their brands. Explain to them why it's so important. The fact of the matter is they're either going to quit or get fired, probably in under two years, which means they're going to need their next job. And if they have a personal brand, that's going to help them Get it. And also, stop worrying about, again, mistakes. I have to go back to that again, because I also hear people, parents telling kids, and I think we were talking about this last night. You know, oh, you got to be careful. Don't put that you were drinking online. Seriously, people, you think anyone's going to care in three years when they're out of college that they, had, they were at a drunk party at one time? They're going to make mistakes, and nobody's going to care. And guess what? The people hiring them are going to be the same people that were doing that a few years before. And the point I'm trying to make is it's not that scary. It's not that hard. All this information is available out there anyway. Be the company that connects with people. Be the company that tells your employees, I want you using social. They're going to do it anyway. Do you know that smoking breaks have gone up in this country in the last four years? You think there's more people smoking? No, they're from the companies who aren't letting them use social in their offices, and they're going out and doing it on their phones, or they're doing it under their desk. If you want to cheat, if you don't want to work, you're going to find ways to do it. 
empower these people, train them and tell them, I want you to become an influencer and an expert. Because the more you have in the company, the stronger you're going to be. And at the end of the day, these platforms are built for fun. Have a little. You'd be amazed at what it's going to do to have some smiles in your offices. A little bit less pressure, a little bit more fun. Get people involved on these platforms. Relationships are like muscle tissue. The more you engage them, the stronger and more valuable they become. Thank you very much, and I might have five minutes for questions or no?